Okay, introduction to gases. Today we're going to be looking at states of matter and I think a fair bit of this will be review but it's super important that rather than memorize that you build your understanding, be able to explain the concepts and apply them in other situations. You will find a FET simulation called States of Matter online and it is a fantastic interactive tool to support your learning. We'll look at it a little bit in class, but I encourage you to check it out on your own also. So I have three open containers here. I've labeled in green, solid, liquid, and gas. So I'm asking you before we move on at all to just use simple, perhaps circles to represent the particles and do this in pencil and fill in uh, some particles that are in the solid state in the first beaker, liquid, in the middle beaker and gas and if you need a lid on that container to prevent the particles from escaping um, then by all means add the lid consider and you'll see what i have in the table below here consider the um, spaces between the particles the shape what does does this collection of particles take the shape of its container um, or does it maintain its own shape? Is there a definite volume or does it perhaps take the volume of the container? Um, think about the types of motion, particles vibrating, rotating, and translating. So can you come up with little symbols to indicate the types of motion that you think those particles are experiencing? So this is gonna take you a few minutes, but you'll be far better off than just copying down the note to actually think about it yourself first and try this. So in pencil, draw particles in each beaker, uh, considering what we just talked about from the table, and then check back with the video. Okay, so hopefully your diagrams look something like this, but don't worry if they don't. Um, maybe you came up with your own um, symbols, but let's have a look together. So in the container of the solids, you'll notice that I first had the particles resting on the bottom of the container because a solid is not going to float in the middle of the container. You'll notice that the liquid, the particles are also at the bottom of the container, reaching out to the sides of the container, which is different than the solids. So does your collection of solid particles sit on the bottom of the container and away from the sides of the container? Just to show that in fact, the solids will have a definite shape. Here, the shape of the liquid is indefinite. In other words, the liquid is taking the shape of the container. And we'll see in the case of the gas that the particles move all throughout the space, so I made sure I put a lid on the container of the gas. I put a container or a lid on the container of the liquid too, because you'll see this one particle seems to have enough energy to escape the surface of the liquid, and so, you know, possibly eventually may escape and so I put a lid there too. Just if you think of leaving an open mug of glass of water on the counter by the end of the day that water level will have dropped the water will evaporate. Of course it's dependent on the temperature in the room and the humidity but um, you will see some liquid particles escape their surface. So in terms of um, the symbols I used, I used these red double arrows curved on either side of the particle to indicate vibrational motion. And I used the green circular arrow here to indicate rotational. And then the yellow arrow in it with a straight line to indicate translational motion. So you can see I've shown the, the solid particles vibrating and they're all doing that, but I thought the diagram would get a bit messy if I, if I put them all in uh, red arrows around all of these. And then the liquid we see vibrational and rotational. Now it's true that this particle up here will also have translated, right? How did it get up there in the first place? It must have translated. And I'll just, just to be clear, all of these particles, right, are vibrating and some of them are rotating. So, um, or there is some rotation happening all over in this liquid. So we tend to have vibrational and rotational motion. And for the gases, right, we have vibrational, rotational, and translational. And again, just to be super clear, the gas particles that are vibrating are also rotating, and they are also translating. So each particle has, possesses all three types of motion in the gas state. So 
I'm going to be asking you to physically demonstrate this, like dramatize this, so all the students in the room being the gas particles, so be prepared to vibrate, rotate, and translate around the room to demonstrate the motion of gases. Okay, so um, in general then we can say the energy of motion or the kinetic energy, that's what the E stands for here, energy, that the kinetic energy of this in the solid state is low and of the liquid particles moderate and high definitely in the gas state. You can see the spaces between the particles are largest in the gas and smallest in between the particles in the solid. And what does that mean for the strength of the intermolecular forces? Well, hopefully you're thinking that these particles in the solid state must have strong attractions uh, to be held so closely together. And here we're looking at moderate attractions, right? And the weakest IMF between the gas particles. And actually, in our kinetic molecular theory, we're going to assume those part of those intermolecular forces to be so weak that in fact there is, we consider no attractive forces between them. All right, so I think we've covered the intermolecular forces, the kinetic energy and types of motion, the spaces between the particles, uh, as well as shape. Now, in terms of volume, the volume is the three-dimensional space that this material occupies, and this cubic structure is definitely uh, occupying a definite volume. Now, when we think about this liquid, if you have 100 mils of water in a beaker and you spill it on the floor, here in the beaker, it's taking the shape of the beaker, the bottom of the beaker. If you spill it on the floor, it's going to spread out flat over the floor. But if you had 100 mils in the beaker and you spill it all, you spilt 100 milliliters on the floor. And so that is a definite volume, even though it's an indefinite shape. The interesting thing about gases is that, and that's our last point here about compressibility, because of these large spaces between the particles, they can actually be forced closer together. And so gases are highly compressible, which really means that their volume is indefinite. What if this lid were a movable lid and we could force push this lid to come down so that it was coming across the container here? What would have happened to these gas particles? Well, they just would have moved a little closer together. Is it possible to compress that gas and so that the particles are so close together they're in the liquid state? Well, it certainly is. And if you've ever, um, if you have a barbecue tank at home, a propane gas uh, tank, then when you pick that up, it's probably quite heavy and you'll hear like the sloshing of the propane inside. And yet when you open the valve, it's definitely a gas at room temperature or the outside temperature and atmospheric pressure. So when they've pumped the gas in there, they've pumped so many particles in there that in that particular volume, they're close enough together to be in the liquid state. So they're under higher pressure. Okay, one last comment to mention, the degree of order, or the opposite, the degree of randomness. Hopefully you're thinking there's a high degree of order in the solid particle arrangement, and here moderate, and definitely a low order or high randomness in the gas state. Okay, so those are all you know important features of the different states of matter. Now what about, let's start to focus in on gases. This unit is about gases and chemistry in our atmosphere. So Brownian motion. This is in particular describing the motion of the gas particles. So yes, they're vibrating, and yes, they're rotating, and yes, they're translating. And how are they moving about in the container? Well, while they're vibrating and rotating, they are moving in a constant random straight line motion until they collide with another particle or the walls of the container. And they'll keep colliding with other particles or, or the walls as they move around, but they're not going to zigzag, they're not doing this, they're moving in constant random straight line motion until they collide with another particle. And so just giving you a diagram here showing you the motion with that yellow path. So the idea that it's constant random straight line motion as they collide with other particles in the container or the walls of the container. So this leads us into then the theory that explains the movement and behavior of gases. So number one relates closely then to the Brownian motion, that the gas molecules move with constant random straight line motion. 
thinking that they are vibrating, rotating, and translating on this uh, pathway. Secondly, we've talked about there being collisions between the particles. Well, the second uh, point here of kinetic molecular theory is that the collisions are perfectly elastic. Now, if you have a bit of a physics background, you'll recognize that, but if you don't, not to worry. It just means that as those particles bounce off one another, they haven't lost any of their energy of motion, so they continue to move as they were, just heading off in a different direction. I've already mentioned point three here when we were talking up in the table. Essentially, the attractive forces between the particles are so weak, as well as repulsive, that they're considered negligible. So in other words, zero. So we assume that there are no forces of attraction or repulsion between the gas particles. The volume of the gas particles themselves, and it is true, all matter has mass and occupies a space, so it takes up volume, but the volume of the actual gas particles itself is not going to be the volume of the sample because that sample of gas, because of the large spaces between the particles, the weak forces between the particles and the Brownian motion, those particles are going to occupy the container. And so in questions this unit or solving gas problems, if you have a two liter flask that contains helium gas, then you can assume that the volume of the helium gas is the two liters of the container. So we'll always take the volume of the container to be equal to the volume of the gas. And the last point here is that increasing the temperature will up KMT. The last point of KMT is that increasing the temperature will increase the molecular motion. So kinetic energy is the energy of motion. So the idea is that if the particles are moving faster, at, they'll be at a higher temperature or raising the temperature of a sample, transferring thermal energy to a substance will cause those particles to move faster. So increasing temperature increases the molecular motion, which is really increasing the kinetic energy. Okay, I make this point here that three and four are uh, assumptions made for a gas under ideal conditions. So we'll revisit that um, when we talk about ideal gases. Okay, so last point is that gases are sensitive to changes in temperature and pressure. And you may recall this from our study of solubility. Gas solutes are more soluble at lower temperatures and higher pressures. Whereas solid solutes really only temperature affected them, pressure didn't. So quick, three quick definitions here. In the context of our gas unit, when you see temperature, think of the motion of the particles, in particular the average kinetic energy of the gas molecules. So if all the students in the classroom represent um, oxygen gas particles, they're not all going to be moving with the same kinetic energy. Some are going to be moving faster than others, some are going to be moving slower, right? And there'll be a number that have a moderate um, kinetic energy. The temperature of that sample, though, is representative of the average kinetic energy of all the particles. Now, as those students are moving around the room, they're going to collide with each other and they're going to collide with the walls of the classroom. Pressure is the force and number of collisions between these gas molecules and the walls of the container. So when you hear pressure in this unit, think collisions. Okay, and then lastly, a reminder here about volume, the idea that gases fill their container and the, the postulate that the volume that the gas particles actually occupy is is negligible it's basically so small compared to the size of the container that we can ignore it essentially means that when we're talking about the volume of a gas we'll take the volume of the container to be the volume of the gas i'm just going to pop right back up here to the fourth postulate here and just make a note here that this is based on the volume of the gas being negligible in other words so small compared to the volume of the container. And that's really the premise. So we're, we're just saying that in a container with a lid, you have a volume of the, of the gas is occupying. If you actually put those particles of gas very close together and pack them very tightly together, that would be such a small 
fraction of space that they actually occupy compared to the size of the container that will just ignore the space that they occupy and say that the size of the container, the volume of the container that they occupy, that is going to be the volume of our gas. Okay, so um, that's it for the introductory lesson.